Brona Katolo de Baba, Legadozo Colo de Boro, Cotosekele de Bire, Nakatani, Kalina, Manangale de Bobo, Jekele de Mala, Manohotia. Nations come into the light of the gospel. Nations come into this truth. The veils are giving way to the glorious light of the gospel. The people of God built up, equipped, edified. The, the word of the Lord coming with power. The word of the Lord coming with witness. Mato Beri Katona Kalia. Father, today we rejoice that we have access into the deep things of God by the Holy Ghost. We speak words which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. I pull down strongholds in the minds of your people. I cast down imagination. I bring down every thought and reasoning under subjection to the obedience of Christ. And we command the clarity of Christ to be made, un made manifest in your understanding through the teaching of God's word. And Father, we give you praise today that by the end of this service, your people will be edified, equipped, and Jesus will be glorified. Nobody lives here the same way they came. We give you praise and glory for answered prayer in Jesus' precious name. And every believer says a powerful amen. amen. Lift your right hands to heaven. Let's release our faith together as we say these words. I am born of God. I am born of the word. The word of God is my nature. I do not struggle to do the word. I do the word naturally. Therefore today, I will understand the word of his grace. I will be built up. By the end of this service, I will never be the same. Never ever be the same again. In Jesus' name, and every believer says a powerful amen. We want to welcome everybody connected to this service by way of Kingdom Life Network, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and all of you that are listening right here in Akwaibom State on Comfort FM and XL FM. It's a joy to bring you the word of God. We'd like you to call friends and friends and family members to tune to this station quickly so that they can be part of this blessing today. And all our house centers in Akwaibom State, we're glad to have every one of you. All our campuses around the world, it's a joy to be able to serve you the grace of God. So I'd like you to get a pen, a notebook, and your Bible, and you can be seated with your sweet smart self as we get into the word of his grace. We've been looking at the legal and vital work of salvation in Soteria season 7, and it's been a wonderful time of studying and learning and growing in the knowledge of Christ Jesus. Hebrews chapter 2 from verse 1. Hebrews chapter 2 from verse 1 to 4. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Lest at any time we should let them sleep. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? If we neglect. The truth of the matter is you have to give attention to the things you have heard. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? Next verse. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. We have seen that in the course of the few days of teaching that Jesus fulfilled the day of atonement. Jesus fulfilled the day of atonement. He actually stood as the two goats. The one that was killed and the one that was left alive. One referred to his body and the other referred to his spirit. And this too was himself. So he offered himself. Each part of that event shows forth the full impact and import of the work of redemption. Let's have another look. We've been looking at the redemption of Jesus being our redemption. We are also going to look at sanctification in this service. The fact that redemption was the price paid. We will discover that the events were outlined by protocol to happen the way it happened. They were outlined by protocol. The events of death, burial, resurrection, and all of that. Look at Luke 24, 44. Luke chapter 24, verse 44. And he said to them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Next verse. 
Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. That they might understand the scriptures. So, when Jesus died and rose from the dead, he said he had fulfilled the scriptures. So, the essence of it is that he actually took the disciples through the scriptures. He took them through. He didn't cross over, which is parables. He went through, which is diharmonia, which is actually interpreting the scriptures. All right? He didn't cross over. He went through the scriptures with them. There are three compartments of the Old Testament, what we call the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. The law of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, first five books, Moses, the prophets, major and minor prophets, and the Psalms. All right? That's the way Jesus put it for them. So we can bring out the work of redemption from these three materials. We can see what Jesus did there. The Bible says that the prophets inquired. In 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 10 to 12. The prophets inquired and searched diligently. They searched and inquired concerning salvation. They were seek searching. And the conclusion of their search and inquiry arrived at the sufferings of Christ and the glory that shall follow. So when we look at the sufferings of those animals, we will see in typology the sufferings of Christ in those animals in the Old Testament. Like Leviticus 16 where we read, one of the goats will confess sins on it. The goat of escape. They will bring the goat, they will lay hands on the goat and confess the sins of Israel on that goat. And then they will release that goat alive to a forest separated from where people are. That's the second goat. All right. Now, we already said that the first goat is a goat of sacrifice, which represented the body of Jesus. The second goat, the goat of escape, which represented separation, the spirit of Jesus separated from God. So Jesus, in redemption, died spirit, soul, and body. His redemptive work took care of your spirit, your soul, and your body. The totality of you was paid for in the redemptive sacrifice of Jesus. Now, please pay attention. So the good two goats are to suffer for what they have not done. The two goats are to suffer for what they have not done because the first goat is killed as a substitutionary sacrifice. Then the second goat is released as scapegoat on behalf of Israel's sins. So the two goats are suffering for what they have not done. That is what Jesus did for us. He suffered for what he has not done. He suffered for what he has not done. So, in the atonement, which we call the propitiation, Jesus stands as the shorty. Jesus stands as the shorty. As the price that was paid on our behalf. So, Jesus began to show them from the scriptures. He told them not to leave Jerusalem, but wait for the Holy Ghost. Do you know that Jesus, in teaching those folks, actually told them, that, that they read, you know, the scriptures. And when they read the scriptures, they should have known that the scriptures was his testimony. Now, when you read the book of Acts chapter 2, you will think that on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost just came on people. You know, the Holy Ghost just looked for some people and fell on them. That's the way the journalistic account of the book of, of Acts gives the impression. But listen carefully. The Holy Ghost didn't come that way. Do you know that the second time the Holy Ghost came was in Acts chapter 10 in the house of Cornelius. Bible says, while Peter yet spake unto them, while he was speaking the word to them, the Holy Ghost fell on those that heard. That means when they heard, faith came alive. When faith came alive, their faith received of the Spirit. So there is teaching required to enable a believer receive the fullness of what is his in the spirit. That will mean, therefore, that in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, the people believed before the Pentecostal experience. Because in chapter 1, they were praying in Solomon's porch while staying in the upper room. And while they were praying, the Bible tells us even Mary, the mother of Jesus, was part of the people that were praying for the Holy Ghost. Meaning, on the day of Pentecost, Mary was there. Mary, the mother of Jesus, she also received the Holy Ghost because Mary, the mother of Jesus, too, had to believe like everybody else. 
she had to believe like everybody else. So there was a believing for the Holy Ghost to have come to them on the day of Pentecost. Now if Jesus sat to them, look at what Jesus told them. Luke chapter 24 verse 47. Luke chapter 24 verse number 47. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations. Beginning at Jerusalem. Next verse. And your witnesses of these things. 49. And behold, I send the promise of my father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Until you be endued with power from on high. Remember what Jesus told them in Luke 24, 26, 27. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Jesus took time to teach them. Observe the prophecy. He said he will enter into his glory. He will enter into his glory. So the question is, was it when he rose from the dead that he entered into his glory? No, it's not when he rose from the dead. Now, but Jesus told them the events that were going to happen. So pay attention because this very critical, what we're looking at this morning, where your salvation is concerned. Pay attention closely. When Jesus died, he told them that, that they don't know him. That they have been reading the scriptures, but they were not paying attention. So when he entered Jerusalem and they were singing, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. That singing and all that drama didn't happen by chance. That was when he died, or that was not when he died. Because all of that drama was part of the protocol that the scriptures outlined before his death. It was part of the protocol. Remember, I told you nothing happened by chance. Everything happened according to protocol. The issue was that their eyes were not opened. So that day, when they sat with Jesus on the table, the last time they sat with Jesus for the Passover on the table, which was called the week of the unliving bread. Please pay attention to these terms. That's what the Bible calls the week of of the unliving bread. Jesus sat there and actually took the cup and drank it. And he said to them, this is the cup. I will not drink it with you again until that day in my father's kingdom. <laughs> I love Jesus. He was, take, he was clearly telling them, this is the last time we will have Passover. I will not drink this with you guys anymore until that day in my father's kingdom. What was he saying? What he was saying is this is the last Passover I will celebrate with you people. And they should have known by the way Jesus spoke. Now when he died and rose from the dead, the day he rose, if they had read and paid attention, they should have known when the Holy Ghost came on the day of Pentecost that it was not just suddenly. That suddenly of Pentecost was a protocol of what has already been planned and the way it has already been said. That's why when you read the Bible, you hear things like, but when the fullness of the time was come, protocol, when the fullness, Galatians chapter 4 verse 6, when the, I mean 4, 4, 5, 6, when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son. Now, if you observe in Exodus 33, Moses was saying to God, show me your glory. I want to see your glory. What Moses was saying is, God, appear in physical form. I want to see you physically. Then God said to Moses, uh -uh, the incarnation is not yet. You can't see me now. You can't see me. The best you can see is shadows. The best you can see is types. There is a time by protocol when there will be a visible appearance of God. And that happened in the incarnation when God became a man through the womb of Mary and walked the face of the earth. That day when Jesus came out of the womb of Mary was the first time God Almighty stepped into the earth and walked on the face of the earth. Jesus is God who came into the earth as a man to save man. That's the first time God ever 
and that is what Moses wanted. He wanted that experience. And you know he was not given because there's a protocol. There's a protocol to how these things are supposed to function. Please pay attention. So it was in sequence with the protocol of scripture that Pentecost happened. I repeat. It was in sequence with the protocol of scripture that Pentecost happened. So when he says suddenly, it's not like mistakenly or, you know, by chance. No, it was part of the protocol, part of the protocol that the Holy Ghost was going to come on them on the day of Pentecost. Now, Pentecost was not just one event. Pentecost was, has been from old. So it was part of the protocol that the Holy Ghost will come during the Feast of Weeks, which culminates in Pentecost. Which culminates in Pentecost. Now, so the first event was the Passover. That's the first event in the calendar. Passover. Then there is also, when the Passover ends, you have what they call the Feast of First Fruits. At the end of Passover, you have the Feast of First Fruits. First fruit is the second day after the end of the unleavened bread. First fruit. So now I've told you three terminologies. There is Passover. There is unleavened bread. There is first fruits. All right. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits. Now, from the feast of weeks, when you count 49 days, 49 days, the feast of weeks will end. The day after the feast of weeks, is 50 50 the 50th day pentecost is 50 pentecost always happens on the 50th day after 49 days of the feast of weeks the feast of weeks now pentecost is the feast of the holy ghost or what the jewish people call the feast of newness newness all of this is part of the protocol their eyes did not just open to see the sequence of events. So the Holy Ghost didn't just come on the day of Pentecost. Because it was already predicted, it was already spoken in the scripture. These events happened as foretold in scripture. They were not accidental. They were a sequence of events in scripture. Now you know that Jesus, after he rose from the dead, spent 40 days of teaching. 40 days teaching his disciples you will see that in acts chapter 1 verse 1 put it up for me acts chapter 1 verse number 1 the former threaties have i made O Theophilus of all that jesus began both to do and to teach next verse until the day in which he was taken up after that he through the holy ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen verse 3 to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So Jesus spent 40 days with the disciples, teaching them. So we know from Acts chapter 1 to Acts chapter 2, that it was a period of 10 days. From Acts chapter 1 to Acts chapter 2, it was a space of 10 days. When Pentecost was fully come. Making Pentecost 50. 50. That is 40, 10 days, 50 Pentecost. 50 Pentecost. 40 days of Jesus teaching. Then 10 days after Jesus' ascension, Pentecost. Making it 50. Now, so Pentecost is 50. Now, Passover, Pentecost, then the Feast of Tabernacles. Passover, Pentecost, then the Feast of Tabernacles. And of course, that's just the calendar. So let's look at those events again, beginning with Passover. Matthew 26, verse 17. Please stay with me. Matthew 26, verse 17. Now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying unto him, where will thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? Next verse. And he said, go into the city to search a man and say unto him, the master saith, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. So this is during the Passover. They took bread and wine. Verse 18, at this point, you know, 
that is the last Passover. Look at verse 18 again. Verse 18. And he said, go into the city, such a man, and say unto him, the master said, my time, my time, that means that's the last one. My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house. Look at verse 26. Now let's see how they ate the Passover. Verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it. So they were eating food. Then Jesus now took bread, broke it and blessed it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take it. This is my body. There is no way that bread was his body because his body was there. Which means that bread was a communication. He was using a symbolism of that bread to tell them something. He didn't cut his flesh and say, take it. He took bread, a communication. Take it. This is my body. Put it up 26, 26 Matthew. This is my body. 27. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, Drink ye all of it. 28. For this is my blood. Now observe. He didn't say, this is my blood physically. He used a symbolic expression to say, this is my blood, put up the scripture, which is shed. That couldn't have been his blood in that cup of wine. His blood was still in his body. Which is shed for many. For remission of sins. You don't drink Ribena to be forgiven of your sins. You don't drink Zobo or Tasty Time to be forgiven of your sins. Which means it was a mode of communication because of the limitation of their understanding. Alright? So he gave them and said, take drink. This is my blood. Give me the next verse. 29. 29. 29. Matthew 26. 29. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit. Jesus himself told them, this one is fruit. This cannot be my blood and this cannot be my body. This is just a fruit of the vine. That is, I won't drink this one that I'm using for symbolic communication. Until that day when I drink it new. So there's something new that is going to come out of my death my burial and my resurrection. Something new will come out, which is not this one. Until that day, put it up again, when I drink it new with you, in my father's kingdom. Ribina will not be in the father's kingdom. Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. That is the kingdom of God. Nothing material. No bread, no Coca-Cola, no tasty time. The kingdom of God is spirituals. Is spirituals. There's no eating and drinking of food. Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. These are all non these are non-tangibles or intangibles, which is the kingdom of God. So he now told them, we will not eat fruit and eat bread. In my father's kingdom is when we will eat something new. Now, so Jesus communicated, but because of their limitation, like many Christians are in that limitation today, cannot see what Jesus was saying beyond the natural elements that he was using to communicate spiritual realities. Stay with me. Now, give me the next verse 30. Verse 30. Verse 30. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. In the Passover ceremony, when you get to the table, the typical Passover ceremony, you will see four cups. Four. Four. Not that one cup. There are four cups. In the real Passover. Then you will see the Maya. The Maya. Then you will see other things like candles. So much ceremony around the Passover. But there were four cups. Don't forget that. Not one cup. That they give you in the rebranded communion. It's four cups. Now, and I will explain and show you in scripture. Why are we studying the Passover? Why? First Corinthians 5, 6. First Corinthians 5, 6. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not 
that a little living, living at the whole lump, seven. Purge out therefore the old living, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. For even Christ, Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. So question, who is the Passover? Christ, not bread, not Ribena, not Coca-Cola. Christ, our Passover. Next verse, give me the next verse now. Is crucified for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old living, neither, look at this, with the living of malice. He has left elements. He has come into the reality of his message with the living of malice and wickedness. Let it not be that, but with the unliving bread. What is unliving bread? Sincerity and truth. He's not talking of elements. He's not talking of snacks. He is now bringing out the substance because this is the epistles, which is the revelation of the scriptures. He is bringing out the substance of his communication. He wasn't talking of eating things. He was talking about a heart that is sincere and true. Now follow me. And that is what makes you unleavened. Unleavened means there is no yeast. It means that there is no pride. It means that there is no you know, hypocrisy. It means you are sincere. It means you are true. That is the way they see you is the way you are. You are not hiding anything. No hidden motives. That is what makes you unleavened bread by this communication. Now please pay attention. We are already unleavened because Jesus is our Passover. Jesus is our Passover. So if we study the Passover, who are we studying? Jesus. That's what we're studying. Because the Passover is part of God's redemptive plan for humanity. The Passover is part of God's redemptive plan for humanity. Now the feast of Passover was actually, he told them, when you eat this Passover, do it in remembrance of me. In remembrance means, do it with me in mind. With me in mind. Because Jesus is the Passover. So in their ritual, their focus was to leave the elements. The ritual was to take them from the elements to the reality. Who is Christ? That was the intent of that communication. Please stay with me now. The feast of Passover was actually, he told them you eat it. So they were four cups. The Passover was instituted in Exodus 12. Exodus chapter 12. That was the institution of the Passover, which was a feast. Remember, when God told Israel that on that night, he will take their firstborn. Let's read it. Exodus 12, 11. Exodus 12, 11. And thus shall you eat it, with your loins guarded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand. You shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. It is the Lord's Passover. Next verse. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. 13. And blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Now, please pay attention. We will see why they are to eat in haste in the course of this teaching. So now, he actually told them, look at verse 14 of Exodus 12, verse 14. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Verse 15. Seven days shall you eat unliving bread. Even the first day you shall put away living out of your houses. For whosoever eateth living bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. So this was a feast God put together when he was to deliver them from Egypt. So on the day of the Passover, 
there were four cups. That's key. There were four cups that were to be on the table. Those four cups represented the four I wills. The four I wills that God did. Now, when they left to the Mount of Olives and sang a hymn, it was a particular hymn they sang from the Bible. That hymn was from the scripture. They actually sang the song of redemption. It's called the Hallel. That's the name of the hymn, the Hallel. H-A-L-L-E-L. -L -E they sang the Hallel. It's a song of redemption, singing about what God has done for them. So now, Exodus chapter 6, verse 2. Please pay attention now. Exodus chapter 6, verse 2. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. Actually, the am is not there. supposed to be I, the Lord. Next verse, 3. And I appeared unto Abraham and unto Isaac and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But by my name, Jehovah, was I not known to them. And I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. Remember, this is talking about bondage. Verse 5. Verse 5. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. Remember that we believers are delivered from sin. We are also delivered from the bondage or the hold of sin. Egypt represented in Bible teaching an authority or a stronghold. That's the meaning of Egypt. It represented an authority or a stronghold. Look at verse 6 of Exodus 6. Verse 6 and 7. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord. Now pay attention. And I will bring you out from under the burdens of Egypt. Number one, I will. Number two, I will read you out of their bondage. Number three, I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. Next verse. Number four, I will take you to me for a people and I will be to you a God and you shall know that I, the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Four I wills. Four I wills. So, there were four I wills on the day of Passover. God executing judgment on those who held the children of Israel captive in bondage. For instance, the firstborn of Egypt represent the pride of the land. The pride of the land. That is why Pharaoh asked them to kill all the firstborns of Israel. Because once you take the firstborns of a land symbolically, you've taken the pride of that land. Pharaoh, the, the government of Pharaoh was by succession. So once the firstborns were killed, the succession of Pharaoh was gone. That was key. Because Pharaoh was also emptied. Now, when what happened to Egypt was the annihilation of the whole empire. That guy, I mean the guy, Pharaoh was destroyed in the Red Sea. And that was the end of Pharaoh. You won't hear of Pharaoh again after that. That was the complete end of the regime of Pharaoh. The four corps spoke of four I wills that God said. The four things he said he was going to do. Number one, the first cup was the cup of sanctification. The first cup, because there are four cups. The first cup is the cup of sanctification. I will bring you out from under the Egyptian. I will read you out of their bondage. Sanctification, meaning I will set you apart. Number two, the cup of judgment and deliverance. He will deliver from slavery. From slavery. Number three, redemption. I will redeem you. I will redeem you. Number four, restoration. I will be to you a God. Restoration. And you will be to me a people. So I repeat for those making notes. Number one, cup of sanctification. I will bring you from under the Egyptian. I will read you out of their bondage. Number two, judgment and deliverance. He will deliver them from slavery. Number three, redemption. He will redeem them. 
Number four, restoration. I will be to you a God, you will be to me a people. Look at Exodus 3.19. Exodus chapter 3 verse 19. And I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No. Not by a mighty hand. Not by a mighty hand. So the four cups on the Passover, the four cups was to speak of God's grace deliverance in the land of Egypt. The four cups. The stripping of that authority of Satan. The removal of that Satan's bondage from God's children. Egypt represented the flesh. And the flesh is the hold of sin and the reign of Satan. Egypt represented the flesh. And the flesh is the hold of sin and the reign of Satan. So he said, I will smite it. So God was actually being, bringing, you know, an undoing of the territory, the kingdom, and the reign of the wicked. It's a disgrace of someone's authority. And this speaks of Satan and his kingdom in typology. Pharaoh represents Satan's rule and authority. So the, the Passover deals with satanic stronghold. The Passover deals with Satan's authority. The song they sang on that day on the Mount of Olives as they were going was from Psalm 136, the Halil. Psalm 136 from 1 to 16. Jesus sang that song together with them. They sang together. Psalm 136 from verse 1 to 16. I mean 1 to 16. That is the song Jesus sang with them to give thanks to God for deliverance that he wrought in the land of Egypt. Now, so in Exodus 14 verse 12, they Passover was instituted. Sorry, Exodus eleven twelve. 12. The Passover was instituted. They were to kill it and eat it. So instead of their lives being taken, the lamb's life, the life of the animals that they killed, they killed the animal, put the blood on their doorposts, and the blood of those innocent animals became their substitute. So the animal died in their place. So when the angel of death sees the blood of the animal on their doorpost, he cannot enter their houses. So that animal died on their behalf. A type of Jesus dying for us. And by the death of Christ, we are free from Satan's bondage. We are free from death. We are free from oppression. And we are free from sin. And as a believer... Jesus' blood is on your life. And when the devil sees that blood, he can't come close. Are we communicating here? All right. So that was the typology that was done in the Old Testament. The typology. So now, Satan will not touch you. Because there's a Passover. And that Passover is the lamb that have been eaten. So Jesus today is our Passover. Now listen. But beyond the ceremony, which is where we are actually going to. Beyond the ceremony, two things. On the Passover night, one lamb is killed. There is unliving bread and there is mamsa. Look at Hebrews 11.28 for clarity. Hebrews 11.28, please pay attention. Hebrews 11.28. Through faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood. Let's see that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. So it was not God that killed the firstborn. There was a destroyer who destroyed the firstborn. The part that God played was to protect those that use animal, which was faith in Christ in typology. God's part was the protection, but there was a destroyer. But when you read Exodus, you will think it is God that destroyed. But when you come to Hebrews, the revelation of scripture, it tells you that there was a destroyer. And the only part God played was to protect those who express faith in the animal blood. So the Passover was to prevent destruction. It was to rid you out of the bondage of slavery. So the Passover dealt with oppression. Four cops. The four cups of Passover dealt with oppression. So when Jesus took the first cup on that day, you know, that one, he said, this is the last one. This is what happened. Jesus took the first cup, took the second cup with them. Then he took the third cup 
and he showed them the third cup. He said, this one is a new testament in my blood. We won't drink this one. This one is what I am about to do in substance. We won't drink it again. We won't drink this one. This third cup is the new testament in my blood because that cup was the cup of redemption. The cup of redemption. Which is shared for many. Then he now, the fourth cup, he now said to them on the fourth cup, I will not drink of this cup until that day in my father's kingdom. So they drank two cups, but they didn't drink two cups. Now, the four cups represented the four I wills that God said, I will read you and bring you out. Sanctification. I will deliver you from the bondage and execute judgment. Thirdly, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. Fourthly, I will bring you out. I will be your God. You will be my people. Then the fourth cup. I will drink the fourth cup with you in my father's kingdom. Those were the four cups on that Passover table. Now if you meet the Jewish people, they knew all that I'm teaching you now. They knew it very well because it was a common practice. I said this to say this. After the Passover, we have what we call the Feast of Weeks, which is the first fruits. The Feast of Weeks refer to first fruit, which refers to the best. First fruit refers to the best or first fruit refers to increase. You know, people that use the first fruit to manipulate people to collect their money. You know, they use it. Every January, tell, okay, your first salary, bring it to the man of God. Your first profit in business, bring it. That's not what the Bible is teaching. That's just a manipulation. That's not what the Bible is teaching. First fruit is not an offering you give to a man of God. I'm a pastor. I should like first fruit. But I will not deceive you to collect your money. First fruit is not money you give to a man of God. First fruit is a symbolic communication. And I will show you the lesson that was communicated in the first fruit. Now, Jesus, when he died, he died as the only begotten son. When he rose, he rose as the first begotten from the dead. And that resurrection will bring many sons unto glory. So the resurrection of Jesus is the first fruit of our faith. Resurrection of Jesus is the first fruit. His resurrection is the first fruit. Please don't miss that. Because our faith follows after the resurrection of Christ. So both spiritually and physically, Jesus is our first fruit. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 20. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But now, Christ is risen from the dead and become the first fruit of them that sleep. Christ is first fruit, not money, not salary, not profit. Look at the sequence. Paul is teaching here concerning Jesus being raised from the dead. Look at the sequence. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. Look at the sequence. But now in Christ, is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep. Next verse. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of of the dead. Are you following? By man came also the resurrection. So first fruit refers to the resurrection of Jesus. Look at verse 22 and 23. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. 23. But every man in his own order cries the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. So repeatedly, first fruit is Christ and his resurrection. Are we following here? So he's referring to resurrection. Look at Romans 8, 23. Romans chapter 8, verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruit of the spirit. It's not money. First fruit in the Bible is just symbolic of resurrection and the spirit of God. Which are the first fruits of the spirit. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves. Waiting for the adoption to wit. The redemption of our body. 
So we have the first fruits of the spirit. What it means is we have the increase, which is from the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus became the firstborn from the dead. That increase of him bringing many sons unto glory is the first fruit. Is the first fruit because Jesus now has risen from the dead. So after the first fruit, 49 days, 49 days, within that period, Jesus sat them down and taught them concerning the kingdom. Then Acts chapter 2 verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, was fully come, sequence, protocol, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, there came a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them clothing tongues as of fire, and it sat upon each and every one of them. And they began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Do you know that if they understood the scriptures, they would have known that he was talking about Pentecost when he was teaching them. Pentecost is newness. Pentecost is Holy Ghost. So Pentecost happened 50 days after, you know, in Acts chapter 2, which is 10 days after the 40 days of Jesus' teaching. Pentecost actually refers to harvest. All right? You know the nation of Israel was born at Mount Sinai. Listen carefully. The nation called Israel, that nation was born at Mount Sinai. That's where the nation called Israel was born. The day Israel was born on Mount Sinai, 3,000 people died. The day that nation was born, they buried 3,000 people. In Acts chapter 2, another Pentecost, because that day Israel was born was the day of Pentecost. And in that Pentecost, they buried 3,000 people. The birth of Israel. But in Acts chapter 2 was the birth of the church. And on the birth of the church, 3,000 people were saved. What we lost in the law, we recovered in grace. Are you following here? That is why the law is the law of sin and death. That's why when it came, it buried 3,000 people. But when Jesus came on Pentecost by his spirit, he saved 3,000 people. That's why we are able ministers of the New Testament, not of the later. For the later kill it, but the spirit of adoption give it life. If I'm communicating, can I hear a powerful amen? Alright, so Sinai was the birth of the nation of Israel. So God established a law, a covenant, that's where they became Israel. That covenant was given from Mount Sinai. And you know, you know, um, the law is dead. <laughs> the law is dead. The new covenant births life. So Pentecost is 50 days. Now let's go back to Passover meal as I begin to round up. Someone says, what about the fourth cup after the Holy Ghost came? Let me just give you something to think about. After the Holy Ghost came until that event in the house of Cornelius... That fourth cup was not fulfilled. Because the fourth cup was where the Jew and the Gentile now becomes one. But remember when they started preaching, they were preaching to only Jews. They were preaching to only Jews. They didn't care about Gentiles. Until after the house of Cornelius, Brother Paul came in now. Brother Paul now scattered the whole thing. And Gentiles were reached. That's the fourth cup. The fourth cup is the restoration. Where the Jew and Gentile are no more divided. Where out of the Jew and Gentile, a new creation is brought in, who is restored to God as a family. Are we following here? All right. Now, please pay attention because these are fundamentals for what we're going to be learning within the week. Look at 1 Corinthians 11.23 now. 1 Corinthians 11.23. For I have received of the Lord, which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. What kind of bread? Unleavened bread. Verse 24. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take it. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Next verse. After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. The word remembrance is not memorial service. Remembrance means... 
do it with me in mind. That is, when you are doing it, let it be in your mind that is symbolic of what I will do. That what you are doing is symbolic of what I will do. Look at verse 26. Verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. The key word there is till he come. Which coming was he going to come? Till he come. Which of the comings? Which one? Till he come means till he rises from the dead and comes into your heart to live. To come into your heart. Remember he said to them, let not your heart be troubled. I go to prepare a place. And when I go, I come. And when I come, I will take you to myself. That where I am, you may be. When he rose from the dead, he came into you. He now lives in you. Where, you, where he is, you are with him. Right now you are seated with Christ in heaven. So he has come that coming. By that coming, that ritual expires. It was till I come. And he has come that coming. Are we teaching here? He has come that coming. Now he lives inside you. How can the main thing live inside you and you're still looking for symbolic bread? How can the main person that the bread and rabina are pointing to now lives inside you and you're going back for bread and rabina? It means you're walking in unbelief. Are we teaching here? Yeah. He has already come. He lives in you. Glory to God. He lives in you. Hallelujah. Now, let me explain further. So the bread is the body of Jesus. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, 16. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16. You know, look at me, everybody. Look at me, everybody. Look at me, everybody. Let's say there is signboard here. There is signboard. Dr. Kweyong, please stand. Dr. Kweyong is standing there, and that Dr. Kweyong is the target, and Dr. Kweyong is Jesus, whom I want to see. So there's a signboard. The first signboard is anointing oil. The second signboard is holy communion, bread and ribena. The third signboard is handkerchief. The fourth signboard is water baptism. All of these signboards are pointing to Christ. So I started following the signboard to arrive at Christ. I followed the first signboard. It led me to the second signboard. It led me to the third signboard. It led me to the fourth signboard and the fourth signboard showed me Jesus. I came to Jesus. Then I now leave Jesus and go back to signboard. Does it make sense? So when you eat communion, you're leaving Jesus to go back to signboard. Because the communion is a pointer to, is to point you to Christ. Now Christ is in you. Then you now leave Christ and you're looking for Christ inside bread and wine. You leave Christ inside you and you're looking for Christ in anointing oil. Christ is the oil. They use oil because they didn't have Christ. He was still in prophecy, so they had to use things to keep their mind on him. Now he has come. He lives in you. You don't need those things. He's now, he's now your life. Christ in you. His name is Christ. The word Christ means Christos in the Greek. It means anointed one and his anointing. So Jesus, the anointing is inside you. You don't need olive oil. He is the oil. Except you want to remain in idol worship. Because many Christians are in idol worship. They can't sleep without touching oil. Oil has represent, re, re, replaced Jesus. They can't travel without oil. Any small noise, they will carry bottle. You are an idol worshiper. Christ is reality in your heart. You don't need elements. The elements have expired. They were pointers to the person. Today we have the substance. Glory to God. We don't need any of the elements. Today, Jesus in you is spirit. The words that I speak to you, they are what? They are spirit and they are what? I, he sent his word and his word did what? It healed them. Somebody say, you know what? I eat the communion so I can be healed. God's healing power now is his word inside you. My son, attend to my words. Incline your ears to my saying. For they are alive to those who find them. And what? Held to all their flesh. The New Testament is a spiritual testament. It's not physical. The Old Testament is physical. The New Testament is spiritual. We are the circumcision that worship God. Where? 
in the spirit and have no confidence where? In the flesh. He that sows to the flesh shall reap what? Corruption. And he said, when you eat those things, they perish with the using. When you drink Ribena and eat bread, the moment you go to the toilet, it goes out. When you put oil on your forehead, if somebody by mistake clean it, it has gone. But Christ in you, cloth cannot clean him. Christ in you, soap and water cannot clean. I feel like I'm teaching here. And that is what you have on your inside, First John 2, 27. The anointing you have received. You have received. You don't need anointing service. Anointing is not a service. Anointing is a person. First John 2, 27. The anointing you have received day. Receive it day. So that you get the English. You have received it day. Eh? Abide. Not visited. The anointing does not visit you. Abide. That means it took up residence inside you. Are you following here? Say with me, I am eternally anointed. Say it louder. Say it louder. Say, I don't need olive oil. Say, I am the bottle. Of God's eternal oil. Don't come to Christ and leave Christ and be worshipping idols. Don't come to Christ and leave Christ and be pursuing elements. Christ is more than enough. Christ is not just enough. Christ is more than enough. And where is Christ? In you. The hope of glory. Am I communicating at all? Alright, sit down dog. Sit down. Sit down. <clears throat> now, let me close. Tomorrow we take off from here. Are you enjoying this? First Corinthians 10, 16. As I close. Woo. I am in the The cup of blessing which we bless. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break. Please pay attention. Is it not the communion of the body of Christ? So now, he's talking about cup. He's talking about bread. And he says the bread is the body. What is he saying? Look at the next verse for clarity now. For we, touch your neighbor, say, no, no, don't touch. Point your neighbor, say, we. You see why? You see? I want touch. Church is about touching. Point your neighbor, say, we. Okay. We, being many, are one bread. We are the bread. Not that thing you bring from bakery. The day you receive Christ, you became the bread. Are you watching? We be many are one bread. Put it up, put it up. Are one bread and one body. Why? For we all partakers, we are all partakers of that one bread. Who is that one bread? Christ. You don't need bakery bread. Christ is the living bread and he lives inside you. So you know what? When I teach like I'm teaching, you are eating the bread, you are drinking the blood in spirit form. The New Testament is spirit. The New Testament is spirit. No rituals. We are not native doctors. No rituals. We are not idol worshippers. No. No. The New Testament is purely spiritual. We speak words. No sending you to your village to bring sound. If there's anything in your village disturbing you, as I'm speaking now, it is rendered impotent. No, you don't need to shout the amen. Just one simple amen is enough. Amen. It settles it. <laughs> yes. We don't need to travel. Even before Jesus died, the man said, uh, Jesus said, I will come to your house. The man said, ah, you? You are too big for my house now. Abba, I'm a soldier. In the military, the general does not travel. He speaks and his words are carried out. You are more than a general in the army. Speak the word only. And wherever my servant is, my servant will be healed. Jesus said, wow, I have never seen this kind of faith. Even in Israel, they don't have it. This is before Jesus died. Eh, people believe that his word carry power. Is it after Jesus rose from the dead that you have to go to your village and bring sand? That is native doctorism. Ladies and gentlemen, what we have is superior to this world. Somebody stand on your feet, shout glory. Our worship of God is spiritual. Comparing spiritual 
with spiritual. Natural with natural. We don't compare Rabina and bread to spiritual realities. No. Spiritual with spiritual. And what is spiritual? The words that I speak to you. They are spirit and they are life. Is it getting clearer here? Are you understanding more? So that when people confront you outside, you have overwhelming scriptural evidence, robust explanation to swallow illiteracy. Tomorrow we continue from here. Blessed? Don't forget four cups. I've not arrived. You know I'm still on the road, right? I've not arrived. And uh, I want to pray for you right now, everybody, wherever you are. If there's sickness in your body, it has no right to stay there. Sickness has no right to stay in your body when it is not paying rent. Sickness has no right to be accommodated in your body without your consent. Sickness has no right to stay in your body when Jesus paid for your body. When your body is owned by Jesus, whatever is not planted by my father, Wherever you're hearing the sound of my voice, in this building, on television, on social media, wherever you're hearing the sound of my voice, whatever is not planted by God in your body, I flush it out. Flush it out. Flush it out. I command it to expire. Its potency is flushed out. In the name of Jesus, body be healed. Body be healed. Receive your healing now. In the name of Jesus. From your head to the soles of your feet, you are totally made whole. I release the manifestation of what Christ has provided. And I declare no weapon formed against you prospers. Every conspiracy of the devil nullified, rendered impotent and useless. You're kept by the power of God. Throughout the course of this week, where you need a miracle, receive right now by faith. Receive right now by faith. Receive right now by faith. In the name of Jesus. Great grace is upon you. Great grace is upon you. Above all, I decree that the revelation of God's word grows big on your inside. Until nothing else matters. Christ revealed his body edified and the glory goes to him. Thank you, Father. And we give you praise for answered prayer. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says that amen on a note of finality. Amen. Glory to God. Now, in another two minutes, I'll be joined Mr. Michael Bush, who is already in the building with me, so we can do the second segment of interaction, question and answers, and all the phone calls in another two minutes. But I want to take up your offerings. Every time you give to this ministry, you enable us to push the gospel to the ends of the earth. Every time you give. Every sacrifice, every money, and every commitment you make to support this vision does not go unrewarded. Because God is not unrighteous to forget your labor of love. You know, Brother Paul said, you gave once and again unto my necessity. He said, you gave sacrificially. And he said, your giving was a sweet smell. A sacrifice acceptable. Then he now prayed, my God supplies all your needs. Everybody watching around the world in this building, I'd like you to grab your offering, your kingdom investments, and your partnership. Whatever you brought to support this ministry, I'm going to take the offering just one time. If you're watching on television or on social media and you need a banking detail, there are banking details on the screen scrolling. And if you're listening on radio, just hold on. By the time I join Mr. Michael Bush, we will give you bank accounts and phone numbers so that you can send in your offerings. But those of you on TV and Facebook, there are banking details. And if there's none there that is relevant to the location where you're watching around the world, if you shoot a mail right now to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. Doctor, one word, Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. Specify your location. We'll send you an account that can work in your area. But thank you for giving. All partners, we love you and thank you for your giving towards this ministry. Lift up your offerings. Let's pray. Father, thank you for everyone giving today. Thank you for everyone making their monies available for the kingdom. I decree right now that as your people give with joy, thank you for the opportunity to build tabernacles. The opportunity to make our monies available for the kingdom of God to keep expanding. And we count it a privilege that our monies will be useful in the redemptive plan of God towards mankind. And Father, we give you praise. That as we honor your word today through our finances, I decree for everyone giving right now, your needs are met according to his riches in glory. This week, favors and ideas and concepts are yours. We decree that you have opportunities to make more wealth and more money. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, that our offerings are a sweet smell before you today. In Jesus' precious name. 
And every believer sees a powerful amen. Praise God. Thank you again for giving and supporting this ministry. Remember, the 30 days of glory continues in, you know, tomorrow evening, 6 p.m. And every day for the whole of this week till next Sunday until the 2nd of August. We are teaching every day. We are building you up with the word of God so that you have stamina for the days ahead. Make sure you don't lose out on what God is doing right now. We love you guys. We're connecting with you in another two minutes. Don't go away, whether on social media, or on TV, or radio, because it's going to be very beautiful this morning. Hallelujah. Are you blessed this morning? House centers and campuses, make sure you stay tuned with us. Let's celebrate viewers around the world, and you know, let's just celebrate them with a shout and a clap all over the building this morning. Glory! You can walk forward. All the messages and books by Dr. Abel Damino. Please call plus 234-806-800-9939 or email powercityoffice at gmail.com. Jesus is the exclusive custodian.